Treasure. And Pinlet on W4CY. Radio. 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 Wake up, America! It's time for the adventures of Pipe Man on W4CY.com, West Palm Beach's number one internet radio station. Here's your host, the Pipe Man. This is the Pipe Man here on the Adventures Pipe Man W4CY Radio, and I'm here with our next guest who I'm very excited about because there's some badass new music that I love, and of course, you know, he's a Jersey boy too, like me, so that that's all the more yeah. reason to like him. Yes. And so here he is, Steve Zing from Black 29. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank so, you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So let's start right off the bat. You know, what exit? Are you are you Lodi, New Jersey, or, or another New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to be Lodi, New Jersey. But uh, what exit? Uh, uh, off, the, let's see, off the parkway, I think I'm exit 156. Okay. So I'm pretty much up there. Yeah, you are. So, like, okay, I bet I've lived all over Jersey. I don't live there now, but I, I, but I'm always a once a Jersey boy, always a Jersey boy. But uh, absolutely, one forty five was one of my original exits. I've done. Okay, so that's down by Bloomfield, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, it was to get on two eighty to go to Roseland. So sure. I, I grew up in Montclair, Little Falls, Roseland. Okay, you ready for this? So then I left Jersey in May, not of my choosing, but May of 1980 and found wow. the Sunset Strip scene because my dad moved me ah. to California. What a time to, you know, move to California, right? Like, so. That was the perfect time. Uh, uh, unbelievable i was just talking about it in our interview like i was at metallica's first show ever slayer's first show ever you know it, it couldn't have been better timing it, we might not even be talking right now if i was still in jersey who knows i don't know <laughs> that's and, right and then yeah. and then at, have been different. that's right and then i moved back to jersey to go to Rutgers. so then cool. I hit pretty much every part of Jersey. I lived in West Orange. I lived in uh, on Garrett Mountain. I lived Jefferson Township, Marlboro, Manalpin, Old Bridge, um, Ocean Township, South Plainfield. You did, like you I did hit, the tour, dude. No doubt. Like there, there isn't. There isn't a part of real Jersey. And I say real Jersey because, like, when people say they're from Jersey and they live in Cherry Hill, I'm like, that's not Jersey. That's Philadelphia. Nah, that's right? not New Jersey. That's Philadelphia. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty cool. But what's even cooler is, man, there's some badass music that comes out of Jersey like yours. So let's well, talk thank about you. that. You, you know, I have to say that Jersey has been blessed with a great multitude of music and artists that supersede like any other state, I think, even California and New York. I mean, look, New York is, you know, you, you have the, you know, the Simon and Garfunkels and the Billy Joels and all that stuff. But Jersey had a smattering of everything, right? From the no 50s and 60s, you know, even the 40s, Get back dating. Let's go back to Sinatra, right, and all that stuff, and you just keep going and going. And we've had them all. It's true. It's totally true. And look, uh, you know, like, so my studio is in Wellington, Florida, and there's this dude that lives across the street from the studio that he also lived near me in Jersey. Uh, his name's Bruce. Oh wow! You know, you know Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. You gotta know Bruce. Like the Bruce? The Bruce, yes. The Bruce. Oh, wow. Yeah. So 
He actually, the gym's gone now, but the gym in our plaza where the radio station is, he used to go work out there all the time. He's the nicest guy in the world, too. But it's funny, I remember back in the day, these girls I was friends with, they always used to, like, break in and sneak onto his property in Rumson to go (laughs) see him walking around in his underwear. (laughs) Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, Of course. I remember being a kid, and my brother... Uh, who's six years older than me? I thought I thought he, he he's not so cool now, but I thought he was cool then because he used to take me for rides in his convertible Cutlass Supreme with Born to Run on the eight track playing. Ah, uh, there you go, right? <laughs> and then then of course the song would be playing and it would fade out. Yeah, he was born to click click <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, so I remember very specifically, okay, so I had Ozzy Osbourne, Blizzard of Oz on 8-track, and Mr. Crowley did that. Like It was like in between tracks and it fade out and then fade back in. It's it's amazing. I remember. <laughs> Go ahead. I remember my cousin, my cousin had an 8-track of Zeppelin, and Stairway to Heaven was playing, and it went... And she's buying the stairway. Click, click. <laughs> to heaven. <laughs> like, this is hilarious. Oh, man. Can, can you believe how far music has come? Like, that. that oh, man. Uh, that we're sitting here doing this interview right now, like, like this, you know, where you don't exactly. have to go into a studio and. You know, oh my God, it's just, it's amazing the transformation we've seen in our lifetime of where music has gone. Like, if you would have told me back then that we'd be doing this right now, like, you're out of your mind. (laughs) You don't know what you're talking about. We're pretty damn lucky. Oh man, it's great. You know, so there's the good parts and there's the bad parts, but I think the good parts are is that anybody can listen to your music whereas back then you know i mean think about it. when you were in sam hayne i mean how many people really had access to music compared to what they would have access to it today oh absolutely you know and what we what we relied on back then obviously was you know doing shows and obviously uh you know the independent music scene right as far as like the indie distributors yeah. all the indie record stores that were around back then. And obviously those are far and few in between now, uh, but especially in this country, but I, you know, I think in Europe, it's probably much bigger than it is here. It uh, is. There's a totally. few great shops, but you know, um, we were very, you know, back in the day, if you remember like bleaker bobs <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was a place called sounds and, and nine nine records and there was all these places back then that you oh, could just get I miss it everything from uh, check this you know, out it, it, this story is going to blow your mind okay so i found a lot of my music that i loved by going to this record store in the valley called oz records hmm. and, and there was a store clerk there who i me and my friends would walk in and they're like he's like here, you got to check this album out. And like, you know how it was back then. You bought an album, you didn't know what it sounded like ahead of time. It just looked right. cool. You know, it looked cool. Oh, I want that. that. That's how I got my first album, by the way. The first album I ever owned in my life, I won at Seaside Heights, by the way. Of course, yeah. did we all got Union Jacks on the boardwalk. There you go. It, mine was, ready for this, the first Kiss album. Right. The first Kiss album, I, I just remember looking up. I didn't know what the hell any of it was. I looked up and I saw that and I was like, oh, I want that. <laughs> I was a little kid. Uh, but I could tell you, I could tell you real quick. The first two albums I won on the boardwalk at Seaside Heights was Fog Hat Live. Wow. And that actually was three albums. It was Stars, Attention Shoppers. And Angel, White Hot. Wow. Wow, that's cool. Yep. I love it. Oh, so yeah. 
anyway, so he showed me all, he, every time he went in, he showed this that. That was Brian Slagle of Metal Blade Records. And oh wow! That's when he started Metal Blade. So I oh, told that's him, pretty cool. Oh, I told him a couple of years ago when I saw him. I'm like, you know, that was the most ingenious thing ever. And he was like, yeah, I was just a store clerk. I wasn't trying to do anything ingenious, but it was. It was like he started Metal Blade, and he was a record store clerk. Like, how ingenious! Like, here, check out my bands but not saying they were his bands just here check this out and uh yeah it was pretty amazing and here we that's sit. amazing i can't even believe yeah, that man. record label is still around like it just you know it's so cool what else i think is so cool i talk about this a lot is that now music like yours can be loved by everybody and i don't mean just because of technology i mean because of the gatekeeping back then you know well you're exactly right i mean it, when you and i were you know back in that day we were spoon fed by what the majors would allow to come out mm -hmm. and you know fm radio at that time i mean still you know even in the in the 70s it was, there was still AM radio, which was big in New York, WABC and NBC. Oh, yeah. That was the, your, your pop stations. And that's what everybody listened to it, You know, FM, I mean, it was for the, you know, the more hipper crowd, but it wasn't like it was in the eighties or nineties yeah. uh, before we got satellite radio, obviously in the two thousands, but uh, yeah, we were spoon fed on um, what was coming out. Totally. And, and, then, today, and then you had the you people know. like, remember when, okay. So I was a metal head that loved punk, but I couldn't go to punk shows because I'd get my, ass uh, kicked, yes. you know? And like, I, it, it just, I always thought it was so stupid too, because there was so few of us in both genres. Like, why wouldn't you join forces? Like we were both getting our asses beat by the jocks in school, at least in LA, that was the case. Oh, it was the same thing in Jersey. Yeah. But, but, you know, I think there was a few bands that tied that together. One of yep. them obviously being Motorhead, right? Totally. I mean, the, punk, the punks loved the Motorhead, as did the Metalheads. And, of course, then you had bands that came onto the scene later on, like the Cro-Mags, right? Yeah. The Cro-Mags kind of fused the punk, the metal, and, of course, they called it hardcore, but it was that combination, I think, of both sounds totally. that really brought the crowd together like that. And you know who did it in L.A. and I was at their first show ever was Slay Slayer because. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Lombardo was a total punk. Jeff was a total punk. And Carrie and Tom were both metalheads. So that is true you brought that all together. And then of course you have Metallica. Oh, I, I remember seeing something about, I think it was Danzig was saying, or not Danzig, Jerry was saying how Cliff Burton was like their biggest promoter, you know, cause he was always oh, yeah. wearing the misfit stuff and so, Hetfield too, you know, but it was like, I, it was recent, like Jerry just did a video recently where he was at a Cliff Burton celebration going on and, you know, he was like bummed out they never got to, you know, actually meet him because of the crash, but he was like, he was our biggest promoter ever. <laughs> so, well, it, you know, uh, I, Glenn and I got to meet James and Cliff. Uh, at if you remember back in the eighties, they used to do a thing called the New Music Seminar. Yeah, and Glenn and I went to see. Check out this bill it was the Sisters of Mercy and Black Flag wow. at the Old Ritz. Wow! And um, and who was there but James and Cliff? And uh, you know, they were obviously in awe. And I I gave. Uh, I gave Cliff my Sam Hain shirt that I had on, and he gave me his Metallica shirt that he had nice. on. Nice. Nice. So, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that was man. pretty cool.
That is, that is way cool. Uh, I was at their first show ever too. That was the beauty of going back, going over to L.A. because I got to see like Slayer and Metallica for the first time ever. That's awesome. Yeah, I was telling. Awesome. I was actually in the last interview I just did. I told this story, and but you haven't heard it, so I want to tell you. Okay, so that at that first Metallica show, this dude gets off the stage and comes up and sits down next to me and starts talking to me and hands me his business card. And I wish I had it today. Um, And it says, white card, blue writing, Metallica, power metal. That's before Thrash was a name, you know, when they were power metal for a minute. Dave Mustaine. Sure. It was Dave, Dave giving me a business card. (laughs) <laughs> oh man we could go on and on about stories it, like uh oh i have one more and then i want to talk more stories about your music though but I, sure. where i where i am now in wellington florida where that's where my studio is uh but i lived there right. for a while too i was in the dentist chair uh, it was, uh, was it like gentle dental or something in Wellington? I forget the name of it. It was years ago. And, right. uh, I'm where I was wearing a misfit shirt. And so the dentist <laughs> goes to me, he goes, you like the misfits? I'm like, yeah. He goes, Glenn's my brother-in-law. <laughs> so oh, wow. I was like, oh, that's a trip. You know, that was pretty funny. Uh, But anyway, yeah. So a lot of these, this is the beauty of this whole genre. I call it one big genre. Screw all the sub and micro genres. We're all one big family. That it's those, all those little coincidences. That's the cool thing, no matter where you go. And I, I love it. That's why when I saw, when Raquel sent over your info right away, I'm like, and asked me to do an interview, I'm like, yeah, in a heartbeat. Because <laughs> we're just one big oh, family. Thank you. So, Absolutely. Let, hey, let's tell everybody a little bit about your music. Because I, 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 when I listened to it, like I was like, oh my God, this is badass i love it i'm glad i'm interviewing him <laughs> um, thank you so tell everybody how it came about and a little bit about the music and why should they should check it out well you know i i i think it's important you know obviously uh, everyone likes uh, well i shouldn't say everyone loves original music because you know a lot of people like old older original music what I was trying to do was trying to come out with stuff that kind of bridged a gap, right? And that, that the younger generation can grasp onto, but the older generation, right? They had something new to listen to. And because there, there's stuff out there that some of it is too emo for an older crowd or to, to whatever, right? You know, for some of that newer uh, new metal stuff. And I'm like, you know, and I don't write with any particular style. I'm not one of those kind of writers that I'm going to write a song like, like so-and-so. I'm not that, but I know what I like. And I like, I like a wide range of stuff. So I'm like, if this can hit my nerve that maybe it'll hit others. So myself and my partner in black 29, Dan Tracy, him and I were members of some other local bands. And due to the fact that, you know, you have all these guys that we played with and they see my success with Danzig and whatnot. And they're all, you know, looking to gain success real fast. Mm. And, you know, this industry, it's here today, gone later today. That's just <laughs> the way it is. True. So, you know, they didn't want to stick around. So myself and Dan kind of looked at each other and we're like, what are we going to do? So I said, well, we'll look for some people, I guess. And Dan said to me, he said, you know, I I play some guitar because I only knew him as the bass player. 
And him and I never wrote a song together. So I said, all right, let's try to write a song. And being that I have my own studio, so we'll record it. So we recorded one song and we kind of looked at each other like, wow, this is pretty cool. So and we just continued the journey. And uh, that's where we wound up because, again, I wasn't going to wait for anybody. And that's something that Glenn Danzig taught me. You know, there's times Glenn goes in the studio by himself. He'll do drums, bass, guitar, vocals. He'll do everything, keyboards, because if nobody's around, he doesn't want to wait. And we didn't want to wait. I could play drums. I could sing. Dan played bass and guitar. Boom. <laughs> we, had our own, we had our own band. There so it worked go. out great. It's such a Jersey thing, too, anyway, because it's like, you don't want to wait. Just do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what are we waiting for, right? E- exactly. So, Bleeding Love. Yeah. I love this song, and, you know, it's about, you know, it's about the torments of life in this world. Yes. This can be a better time in history to have a song like this. We need it most. Like it's it's, it's weird because it's almost like, and I'm just coming up with this now. It's almost like 2023 is the '80s turbo version, meaning not having anything to do with the '80s, but back in the '80s. We had the Cold War. The whole world was going to blow up by 1984. We had all this stuff going on. And I'm telling you now in 2023, that was mellow compared to the crap we're dealing with today with everything and people, what they're going through and all the th- torments of life. Like it, it's, it seems to be getting bigger. And that's why I say turbo. It's, it's, it's beyond, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's really good, a, a good uh, uh, word to use is turbo. And I, I'm, I feel bad for, the, for younger kids, especially, you know, those whose parents sit there and watch the news. You know, obviously we know, you know, a lot of it is propaganda, a lot of it is meant to sway you to one side and divide everyone. And unfortunately, you know, this has happened before. It's happened since the dawn of time, right? Yeah. Since it, since we've had any one person that was an elected official, it's always been there. Wars have been there from the days of the Bible, right? Yep. I mean, religion killed more people than anything. But we see it constantly because we're constantly in a connected state, whether it's your phone, your news, it's constant. It's 24 hours. So, you know, for the younger generation, I think a lot of them don't even feel like they have hope because it's this divide thing. It's, it's, are we going to, is China going to blow us up? Is Russia going to blow us up? I remember the cold war. I remember back in the 70s and 80s with the problems with Russia. I mean, it's nothing new. It just seems to repeat itself, except we have more accessibility to the constant Mm -hmm. torment of the state of affairs. Yeah. You couldn't put that better because it's true. I tell you, it's pretty funny on that note. one One of my daughters, I was saying to her one day, I was like, you know, some days I just want to drive down the road, take my laptop, my phone, and my iPad, and throw them out the window and keep driving. And she's like, Wouldn't that Dad, be great? Right? She's like, Dad, who are you kidding? You're just as addicted to, as anybody, which is true, but... We are. Uh, we're all guilty. Yeah. I said to her, you're right, except I also remember a time when we didn't have any of this crap, and it was a lot better, because... I, I, you know, all the anger and angst and stuff we see now is, I think, a total product of all this technology and, you know, just people being able well, to say how, whatever how the hell they want. How many kids have anxiety? I know, how right? Many, and, and adults, and it's, it's more, uh, you know, with the opioid addiction and, and addiction to, 
to drugs like Xanax and whatnot. And that is because we cannot disconnect. Our minds are constantly Mm -hmm. in a state of movement. We don't have any kind of rest. And the first thing you do when you wake up, most people, is they pick up their phones. Yep. Right? We're all guilty of it. We're all looking to see, did I miss something? Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember going to Europe, this is maybe 10 years ago with Danzig, maybe 15 years ago. And at that time, it was it was very expensive to have cell service. So I would just keep my phone off, obviously. And you know what? It was such it was such a breath of fresh air that I couldn't be connected like we are today. And you you just felt like you had some freedom to actually think. And the problem is we can't think anymore because they're doing the thinking for us and they're forcing it down us to to make a decision, right? Whether you're going to go to the left or to the right. And we're, we're not allowed to really decide for ourselves anymore because they've got us connected and they're making the choice for us. Yep. No, that's my personal opinion. Oh, I agree a million percent. And you know, it's like also, I mean, I think about things even as stupid as, you know, if let's say something happened with something you bought and the store was closed, like you didn't stress over it. It's like, oh, I guess I just have to wait till tomorrow when the store opens. Now it's like, mm-hmm. oh my God. It's 3 a.m. I have to get a hold of somebody to take care of this, you know? Or, and, oh, yeah. And I, I get it all the time. Like, I run a radio station, and I have clients that are texting me in the middle of the night. Like, well, you know why, Dean? They because they can Because nobody wants to wait. <laughs> Yeah. We we live in an instantaneous world, an instant no, no. gratification, and nobody wants to download. We want to stream, right? Because yeah. download actually may take a few more seconds. So let's just <laughs> stream it. Yeah. All right. And totally. You know why? Why do? Why isn't there more kids taking music lessons out there? Right. There's a big void in music because all of the the great are going Bowie and Prince and and there's nobody to replace them Mm -hmm. and why is that because no one wants to learn an instrument because you actually have to sit and learn and disconnect and learn nobody wants to do that because it's easier to push a button because it's instant gratification no doubt and it's a problem you know what's funny and it's not funny but there's this meme out there I don't know if you've seen it to your point of what exactly what you're saying it and what it has is the picture on the top is the 80s rock star and it shows some dude on the ground passed out guitar in one hand and a jack daniels bottle in the other and then it has the the rock star today and it's some dude sitting on a chair in front of his computer <laughs> it's true Oh, my God. I mean, it. you know what? The new <laughs> rock stars are influencers. Yeah. And they're they're not even known. They're not well known. They're known by the average person who doesn't even know what they're even being influenced by. Right. But those are the new rock stars. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I can't say it's bad. Look, at the best, it's pop culture. But even pop culture you know, in the seventies and eighties had a short lifespan because, you know, as you, you kind of, as your mind matured, you graduated to the next thing. If it, if it was a one hit wonder, look at the day, uh, David Cassidy's of the world, mm. right? They were huge. They were selling out stadiums and they went by the wayside, the leaf Garrett's, but now you have the Justin Bieber's because and they're around because they're pop culture at its best. And they could stick around because they can just keep feeding you the information. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a different type of world. And, and, and it's, again, it's all about, it's all about clicks, right? Yeah. Oh, you're speaking my language, brother. You know, it's like. And, 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 and Dean, I'm not, a, I'm not against the Justin Bieber or Justin Timberlake. I don't care. 
but it's it's a different world and, and if we didn't have the internet to keep it in your face it wouldn't be there the kardashians would be over because oh yeah they would be you know there would be no show like that so it's just that we're it's it's a constant feed it's it's you know it's the motion man it's all and about is, the motion and there is no time to ever shut down like you were saying before because Everything is 24-7 nowadays, and everything is instantaneous. And, like, it was kind of cool. I think about it sometimes even now, okay? Like, going into a pit, okay? I have to actually, like, turn to whoever I'm with. I'm like, here, hold my phone. Uh, and, like, I didn't have to worry about that back in the day, you know? I didn't have to worry about what I had and just, like, go in the pit or or, like, the people that go in the pit with their phone to film it. Like, seriously? I I just, I don't get it, you know? It's like, look, you just know, enjoy it. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. Glenn Danzig has this thing that we don't allow photos. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not because it's taking a picture, but it's the thing of, I went to a Garth Brooks show with my wife, right? And we stood behind a guy who had his iPad with him mm-hmm. and filmed the entire show. I ha- we literally, my wife is, you know, she's five, two or five, three. She literally had to watch the show through his iPad. And that's, that's ridiculous. What, you know, most people aren't just taking a picture. They're standing there. Enjoy the friggin' moment. Like, what are you doing that, you know, you, you will never watch this more right. than one time. Right. Go home with the memory, man. You know, those memories are in our minds and, and you're going to, you're, you're taking up precious space on your phone for no reason. And you're, you're not even enjoying the show. You're watching the show through your phone onto the stage. Yeah. And they might the as well just watch watching... YouTube. Just watch YouTube. Exactly. I mean, like I got to tell you, you're going to love this one. Okay. So one, there was some dude on their phone at a Slipknot show that he was up front and Corey went up and slapped him out of his hand. I saw that. <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Right. And, and that's the thing why at, at Danzig shows, Glenn sees that all the time. And you know what it's like? You're trying to put, you know, who are you performing to the people or the phone? And then there's the people who put the, the the light on the phone in your face. It's like, really? Come on, man. No you know, doubt. You didn't pay to come stick your phone in the air. Just go have a good time. Get crazy. Go have a good time. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like as my wife would call it a boomer. Right. <laughs> but it, it's true. It's like, it, it's like they're missing out. If you think about, you know, the way we communicate, and I'm sorry we got off on this tangent, but That's all right. the way we communicate, it's not about what, what a kid's going to do, right? Hey, remember that, remember that text I sent 17 years ago? No, you missed out on the best part of communication with people face-to-face because we've used email and text because we really don't want to talk to a lot of people, right? Yeah. So but you're missing a lot of those memories and the camaraderie of being a human being. And it's, it's really the start of the artificial intelligence thing. Oh, yeah. You know, we're, we're talking behind a screen because, and you don't know what emotion that really is. Are you mad? Are you not mad? Some things you could sound like you're mad. Maybe you're not, but you can't really, you can't really get that across in, in a text or an email. A lot of people decipher things differently. Yeah, 100%. So. And you know what else, too? Is think about it. The experiences you and I had back in the day in the scene, those are so implanted in our memory banks. And I think about kids today that they consider taking these pictures and videos as their memories, but they so rely on the technology that they won't have these amazing memories that you and I have of shit that we experienced. Yep. 
you know, you know, I, I, there's, even if you had a phone back then, you could not capture those times and those feelings in a picture on a phone, nothing. It's, Mm -hmm. it's all in our heads and it's a good place to be. Oh, right. 100%. And, and thank God, as the joke goes, they don't have evidence on what I did back then. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed, my friend. <laughs> so how does everybody uh, reach out to you, connect with you on social media, speaking of this technology, and, uh, and check <laughs> well, out you your could music? Stay, you, could, you could stay uh, connected to me at all times of the day and night. You know, either on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, my email's easy. Steve Zing at stevezing.com. I made it easy. You know, Instagram is Steve Zing Sam Hain. And I think Facebook is the same or something like that. I don't even know. But uh, I'm easily accessible. And, you know, the best part of this business is actually connecting with people. It's when we do the shows and you talk with people and it's it's important because that is the true connectivity that's that is what's make, getting your point across your live shows you know your one on ones and again it's not about the text it's not about somebody watching your video a year later going oh yeah that was. no it's not that it's a true connection you know i mean mar- I, I, I imagine marriages where you know, and maybe maybe for some people it actually would work better if the husband and wife didn't even live together, or they lived in separate rooms and they just sent texts back and forth. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of you know bullshit that we're we're living in, and, and again, we're all living falsely behind the screen. So I think I think you know being uh, connected to people, especially like I said, doing live shows and and meeting you know fans and friends afterwards is so important yeah 100 listen that was part that's part of why i'm a metalhead today and that is those experiences i had not just the music of course i love the music but it was just the experiences and like as we always talk about like we're just one big family you know and a lot of people that are not from the punk scene or the metal scene don't really get it, but we lived it and get it. I, I don't even know if people today get it. The newer people coming up get it, you know, because there's some bands when I hear kids say, oh, this punk band, and they name a band, and I'm like, yeah, that's not punk. <laughs> you, you're, you're right. But you, you know what's interesting is that I, re, you know, when I was a kid going to shows, you know, and, and look, a lot of the early punk, especially all the punk that was coming out of the UK, you know, that was all uh, politically based, right? The sex yes. systems were all about, you know, God save the queen and whatnot, you know, so, you know, but one thing we never did, you know, we, we, at, like you said, we were divided at one point between punk and metal. That was a genre but we were never divided because of the political situation no like doubt. we are today. No doubt. It had nothing to do with that. I see it in music that. now. Like I'm seeing artists gain ostracized because of their political belief. And it's like, isn't the whole point of being in music to express whatever you want to express it? Like why should, why should it be that way? And it's funny because I've seen some bands like pe- people I know and, uh, that, you know, are very different now <laughs> than they were back then. And it's like, hmm, makes you kind of wonder. It's like kind of weird to me sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't know. But, you know, um, being divided because of politics. It's stupid. If you think about it. Well, b- besides the fact that it's stupid, you know what? It's. It's all smoke and mirrors. Oh, no. and, I say it all the and time. neither and neither side are getting out alive, so it doesn't matter. No doubt, I say it all the time that they're all on the same team, and it ain't mine. Exactly, you hit the nail on the head, Dean. 
That's right. So with the nail what, on the head. What else uh, do we need to share with the listeners about your music or anything up and coming? Well, you know, we have a new video. We have a new video coming out for the song Blackout, which is the lead song off the album. And I'm hoping that'll be premiered in the next two weeks. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to be um, starting to do shows hopefully in a few months. And of course I have my old punk band from the eighties that uh, we kind of reunited and put out some new stuff on Cleopatra as well. And we'll be doing shows there. So, you know, it's a busy year um, ahead of me which is great. I love to be busy. I'd rather be busy than be connected in on a, on a phone. Nice. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. And, and again, we're just trying to, you know, create music that a is not overproduced and B that hits a nerve with people that can just sit there and go, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, I'm not trying to reinvent music. I'm just trying to make people feel it. And that's what it should be. That's what music's about. You know, it's it's great to listen to, but it's about feeling it. That that makes it, it's the best therapy I can think of. It's it's the best escape for me from all the insanity that's going on in the world. You know, there's nights where I'll I'll get up at one o'clock in the morning, and my wife said, "Can't I can't sleep?" I'm like, "No," and I come downstairs in my studio and I put my headphones on and I just listen to music. Yes. And it, I just, it takes me to a different place and I sit there and obviously I could do it in bed. I could put my earbuds in and put Spotify on and, and have the world at my fingertips. But sometimes I just like to, you know, I go in my studio, close the door. It's my little cave. And I, I, I hit every type of genre and a lot of stuff that takes me back to my youth. Right. Yeah. And because those times, it's like, why do all these older acts, you know, why, why are they, nobody wants to hear their new music. They only want to hear the old, the, the old stuff. You know why? Because it takes them back to a time where they didn't have to think. No right? doubt. So sometimes, Dean, it's sometimes it's good to go to that place where at that time, you and I didn't really have to think about life. We just went along for the ride and we wound up in a good place, right? We wound up at the next show and you wound up in, you know, you were in Montclair and you were in wall, you were in all these places and then you were in Hollywood and you came back, but you were all, you were there. You were present. Right. And a lot of times we're not even present anymore. So it takes us back to a time. So that's sometimes that's what I do. But that's what I intended Black 29 to be. Music to move you by and basically stuff that you can walk away going, make you feel good, but it's got energy. And it definitely does that. And I think it's badass. And everybody needs to check you guys out. And uh, I can't wait to see you live. That's going to be fun. Yeah. It's going to be great. Love it. It's going to be great. And I can't wait to meet you. Absolutely. And uh, I thank you for giving us great music at a time that we need it most. And thanks for being on the Adventures of Pipe Man. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for listening to the Adventures of Pipe Man on W4CY Radio.